Good morning, folks. Good morning. Please have a seat. My name is Greg, and I come from uh, from Sanctuary, just a few blocks away. And uh, there are many ways in which I suppose we live our lives out in very different worlds. But there are a surprising number of connections here. I've just recently uh, met uh, Tay and look forward to getting to know him a little bit better. But uh, for many years, um, Brendan and, and Sandra were a, a wonderful support in a whole variety of ways to one of our staff, a guy named Steve Martin, who was going through a lot of really challenging issues in, in, in his personal life, but also at the same time was, was working in an extremely demanding area of street outreach, working with women who were involved in the sex trade, amongst other things. And, and uh, so, so uh, still to this day, very, very grateful for their care of Steve, who is now uh, an Anglican deacon uh, in somewhere between uh, uh, Dawson City and Whitehorse. Um, I don't know how he stands that, but <laughs> Steve loves the cold weather, always has, and so grateful for that. And, uh, and so that's a wonderful connection. Um, also, uh, um, Merv Mercer is, a, is a, a member of our board, has been for many years. In fact, he's currently the chair of our board, and, and uh, I know Merv was, was here as an, uh, an interim priest for, for some time. Uh, very grateful for, for Merv, also in the life of, of our community organization. And of course, Simon Berstow uh, is a member of our staff, has been for several years, and, uh, and for several, a few years before that, a member of our community. And he's an extraordinary young man. He's a really, truly wonderful young man. In fact, sometimes we just call him Jesus. You know, he's got the long blonde hair, and, and, uh, and he's got the whole attitude and everything going on. Um, it embarrasses him to no end when we do that, but, uh, but everybody in our community loves Simon. I don't know anybody who doesn't love Simon. So there's at least three gifts, three really significant gifts from this church here, from this uh, part of the body of Christ to uh, the little body of Christ that is meeting down at uh, Bloor and Young, Charles and Young, um, and uh, continuing on there. So thank you for your care of us, whether it was intentional or not, your care of us through the years has been extraordinary and generous. So it's my honor to, to be able to speak with you today about uh, about. Uh, the maybe my favorite resurrection story well you know what it's probably not probably my favorite resurrection story is the story of, of mary magdalene coming to the tomb but i can't afford to get off on that today uh, this this is a close second though i love this story because i love what happens with these two people who are walking along cleopas and somebody else we don't know who that other person is but some people think it was his wife and we were very much in keeping with the attitude of the time and in fact the attitude we see in this same passage uh, towards women that she wouldn't even be mentioned or, or acknowledged. Um, uh, there's there's a, a point in this passage where as they go along and they're talking to the disguised Jesus and they refer to, to the fact that women have told them that they've seen him arisen and of course they dismiss it because it's just a bunch of crazy women. That's essentially their attitude. The great news of course is that Jesus certainly didn't think that way because he appeared to the women first. <laughs> He spoke to them first, and in fact, he hid out, it seems to me, in the garden, um, waiting for the men to come and go until Mary Magdalene was on her own, and he waited until she was alone, and all the men were out of the way, and then he approached her. So, uh, so there's still a sharp learning curve at this stage for the church to go through as regards uh, women and, and, uh, and Christ's love for them and God's love, love for them. But I love this passage because these men are, are these two people, this man and woman or whoever it is, Cleopas and his companion, are deeply, deeply puzzled about what's going on. And I feel that way a lot of the time. I feel that, uh, that so much of the time my course through life, my course through a life of faith even, is characterized not by certainty but by deep puzzlement. And, and these folks started with tremendous certainty. They started out with a certainty, for instance, about what the Old Testament passages meant. They were well-versed in, in the teachings of, of Scripture. And they were sure what they, that they knew what those passages meant. And, and then they were sure of who Jesus was. Although this, in, in this part of the story, they cave, they back off of what they had really believed 
uh, and they say, well, he was a great prophet. That's a, that's a serious come down, folks, when they say he was a great prophet in Israel, um, that, uh, when they refer to him that way in this passage, because they've backed away in just a matter of, of maybe 48 hours or 72 hours or something. They have backed away from their earlier view that this is the Messiah. This is the one who has come from God to change everything. And they thought, they were certain that Jesus was the Messiah. They were right about that. But the problem is that they thought he was a completely different kind of Messiah. And they were sure that they knew what that kind of Messiah would be. They were sure that this Messiah was going to come. He was going to retake the throne of Israel. He was going to make Israel a a one nation again, gather the lost tribes and and reinstitute the throne of David. And the nations would would stand back in awe and wonder. They would throw out the the Roman dogs. and, uh, And just incidentally, of course, these folks would all have positions of power, influence, and wealth (laughs) in the new kingdom. Um, But that's what they really believed. They were sure that's what was going to happen. And then all of their certainties were crushed. All of their certainties were just smashed beyond anything that they had experienced when, when they stood, probably from afar, these two, and watched the one on whom they had pinned all of their hopes, nailed to a cross, raised up, and they had seen or heard that he had died. They knew he had been placed into a tomb. And not only that, now they have to suffer the indignity of crazy stories about him coming back to life. It's as if all of their hopes and dreams had been taken and smashed and then mocked. And, and so their certainties have all fled. And as they walk along this, this road, they would have gone uh, out of uh, the gates, the, probably the same gates that Jesus left in order to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, crossed the valley, up the hill, and along the ridge for seven miles to, to Emmaus. Now that sounds like quite a walk for us, but for them that's the kind of thing you do before breakfast in this day and age. They, they thought nothing of walking 15, 20 miles a day to, to get somewhere if they needed to, because um, that's how people got around. And so they, they begin this walk, and, and I love this moment when, when the stranger appears and, and he says to them, what are you talking about? And I don't know why they didn't recognize him. The, the inference apparently in the construction uh, of the, the Greek text here is that, that when it says they were prevented from seeing or recognizing him, the inference is that the blockage to seeing him was, was his interior, that, that it was within themselves somehow doesn't define that, but that's the inference, apparently, in the construction of the passage. The idea is not, apparently, that God prevented them from seeing who Jesus was, or that Jesus prevented them, but something within themselves could not believe that this man who walked up alongside them was the same man that they had seen uh, just a, a day or so before nailed to a cross. They couldn't believe it. It was beyond the realm of, of rational thought and beyond all of the things that they were certain of because they were certain that Jesus was dead. And then, and then Jesus says to them, what's going on? And they say, well, did you just crawl out from under a rock? How could you be in Jerusalem this past week and not know what was going on? This same Jesus who, was, who, who rode into town as a, as a king that everybody acclaimed, they took him, and he was a great prophet, and they took him, and they nailed him to a cross, and they put him in a tomb, and, and, uh, and all of our hopes are smashed. And, and as they begin to tell this story, it says that they stood and their faces fell and they looked at the ground. They stood downcast. It stopped them dead in their tracks when the stranger asked them, what's wrong? What's going on in your lives? And, and suddenly the sheer weight of the loss of their expectations caved in on them. And then Jesus begins to speak to them. And uh, it seems a little bit rude, maybe, to us, but he says, Oh, you foolish people, don't you understand anything? Let me explain this stuff to you. And then he begins and he opens the scriptures to them and begins to, to explain to them from the beginning who the Messiah was really supposed to be. And as they go along, these men are are more and more excited. They think this is, this is incredible, this is wonderful. And they get to this little town in Emmaus, but perhaps one of these people owned a, a property there. That's probably the reason that, that they were going back to Emmaus. Perhaps they'd gone to Jerusalem for the, fe- for the feast days and they were going home again. 
And as he, as he makes to go on, they say to him, um, won't you come in and eat with us? Because something is coming alive again in them, something they didn't expect. And so he does. He comes in with, with them and he sits down and they eat. And, and he, he does something extraordinary. Um, Cleopas perhaps even had the bread in his hands because that would be his role as host, would be to take the bread and give thanks for it and break it and distribute it. And, and I imagine, it doesn't say this in the text, but I imagine Jesus reaching across the table and taking the bread out of his hands and saying, can I do that? And he gives thanks for it. And he breaks it. And in the moment that he breaks it, they recognize who he is. Now, this is interesting because these two were not present for the Last Supper. They weren't there. They didn't have the experience of Jesus saying, this is how I want you to remember me. There's something really mystical going on. I, I wonder if they were there when he broke bread for 5,000 people on the hillside, and they remember that. Well, whatever it is, there's some kind of revelation, and in this moment that they have not expected, they see something entirely new. They see a Jesus that they had never expected, and they're thrilled by it, and then Jesus is gone. <laughs> it must have been an extraordinary experience. They're so excited, they run back and they tell the disciples, and then they get to, see, get to see him again. How great is that? Folks, um, these men, as they walked back to Jerusalem that day, it says immediately, they started out immediately, another seven miles <laughs> at night. Um, they, they said, we should have known. Didn't our hearts burn within us? And this is where I identify with this. I have met Jesus face to face many times, actually, in my life. I've met him in uh, broken uh, street people. Uh, I've met him in a variety of other folks, and you would think you would meet him in transcendence, but my experience is that, that uh, he crushes my certainties and he dismisses all my expectations and he shows up when I least expect him, and often he shows up in the most broken, needy people. And so. Recently, I was at an event at Sanctuary that I didn't have to do anything at. It's wonderful. And I came in and I sat at the back on the floor with two First Nations men who were brothers of mine. And we sat and we just chatted. And as I sat and I looked at them, these men who are uh, in their mid-30s to, to maybe early 40s, there's two of them, um, and their, their faces are battered. They're full of scars. And you, you just a glance at them and you know that they've been street involved. And I... And I thought of that passage in, in Isaiah where it says of Jesus that his face was so marred more than any man. And there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. And, and I thought, I'm sitting here with Jesus. And these men blessed me. Um, I could tell you a gazillion, a gazillion stories about all of that, and, and many that are far more dramatic than, than that one. But, but that's a recent one that sticks in my mind. And, and I, I often don't know it till later, you know? But there's a burning in my heart. There's something happening interior that, that's mysterious and something that I can't exactly divine, define. We have a tendency to think that faith operates in those areas where we are certain of what we believe. And this is what I want to leave with you today. We have a tendency to think that God will show up because we are convinced of a particular thing, a particular belief, a particular course of action, and that, that in this moment, that's when we're stepping out in faith, is when we really believe this wholeheartedly. And we have this idea about faith that it's a matter of clutching onto something with both hands and hanging on. But the reality is, that the moment for faith, the moment when God really shows up, the moment when Jesus appears to us, is when our certainties have been crushed. These men had their certainties about the Bible crushed. They had their certainties about who Jesus was crushed. They had their expectations for the future crushed. Their relationships at this moment probably smashed because they're thinking, we can't afford to hang around with that crazy group of people. They're going to get in trouble. They just crucified Jesus. Why wouldn't they crucify the rest of us? All of that crushed, and yet in this moment, that's when Jesus arises, or arrives. And I want to suggest to you that, that, that he, he opens their hearts, and that's why their hearts are burning. He opens their minds, because 
with their certainties crushed about what the scripture meant, they can begin to understand it in a different way. With their certainties about who the Messiah was supposed to be crushed, they can begin to understand who the Messiah really is in a different way, in a true way. With their expectations about their own future crushed, they can, can begin to understand that there's a deeper, a greater, a more glorious, and probably a far more painful future for them than they had ever expected but one that has import not only for this world, but for the next. One that's rooted in the eternal life that Jesus Christ brings to us. And so they have a new life. And their hearts burn within them. He opens at last their eyes so that they can see truly. Brothers and sisters, our calling as people of faith is not to be certain. Not to hang on to the things that we think we know that, that, uh, that we're convinced are, are true necessarily, but our job in following Jesus is actually to be open. To open our minds, to open our hearts, to open our eyes, or, or at least to invite him to do that for us, because we are probably unable to do it for ourselves. And what happens in this moment is that instead of new certainties, we have a meeting with Jesus himself. And that is life. That is where we live. And this is how we walk the path with Jesus right by our side. He's with us when we don't recognize him. And he's waiting for us to invite him to open our minds, open our hearts, and to open our eyes. May we do so.